Across the country, thousands of people have died and have never been identified. I'm T. Chappelle. And I'm Lee Zurich. Today on Investigate TV Plus, the science helping to solve families' biggest mysteries. What was your reaction when you got the DNA results back? I knew. I knew it was him. I was totally convinced that that was my uncle that they found. We reveal how the technology can offer closure decades later and how it can even catch killers. Plus, the financial cost of gun violence. This is a problem that impacts everyone in some way, shape, or form, even if they don't realize it. And a community's mission to break the cycle. The doctors are doing life-saving emergent medical care, and we do soul care. We do heart work and a second-hand shopping surge. People are really looking for ways to make money, to get rid of some items, to help supplement things. How to cash in on clearing out your closet. In-depth stories that inform and inspire. You're watching Investigate TV Plus. Cold cases unable to be solved, missing people unable to be found human remains unable to be identified for decades. Now imagine those cases all have answers. Answers that come from using forensic investigative genetic genealogy. It's helped to identify missing people and catch criminals across the country. Investigative reporter Kristen Crowley shows us the impact this technology is having in solving yesterday's mysteries and today's crimes. Across the country, hundreds of thousands of people are missing. For 40 years, Jack Langeneckert. Very handsome man, loved the good life, dressed impeccably. Was one of those people. At the time, we thought that he probably ran away somewhere. We never, had, we never did hear from him. Russ Marty is Jack's nephew. Now in his 70s, he was much younger the last time he saw Jack in 1982. What do you remember from the day that Jack disappeared? I remember my mom and my grandma going absolutely bonkers. I mean, they were really upset. They were more upset the second day when they found out that he had emptied out the bank, my grandmother's bank account. Thousands of dollars in stocks and bonds gone. The only thing investigators ever found was Jack's car, abandoned at St. Louis Lambert Airport. He was reported missing, but as the years dragged on without a trace of the 50-year-old realtor, the family stopped talking about Jack. The family was very mad at him. Your uncle's sisters and his mother died thinking yes, he was still thinking out there. That he was missing. Then in 2023, Russ got a call from detectives. They wanted his DNA to test against some human remains. Those decades old unidentified human remains cases are what we specialize in. In 2022, the Lincoln County, Missouri Sheriff's Office sent the unknown remains to Southeast Missouri State University anthropology professor Jennifer Bankston and her students, relying on them to extract viable DNA for testing. My students' testing indicated that we had some really good candidate bone samples uh, to send off to the lab that we love to work with um, Othram in Texas. Othram is a leader in what's known as Forensic Investigative Genetic Genealogy, or FIG. Bankston says Othram's technology can look at tens of thousands of markers on a genome far beyond the capabilities of traditional DNA testing. Othram has used FIG to solve all of these cases, giving names to men and women, even children, across the country. So here's how it works. A person uploads their DNA to a website like DNA Solves, GEDmatch, or Family Tree DNA for investigative purposes. Those companies then upload the unknown DNA and try to find the closest match. Typically, that's a third cousin. And genealogy experts say the average American has 190 third cousins. They have to whittle it down, and they do that by breaking them off into family trees 
trying to find the closest living relative. The closer relationship you have, the more DNA you share. They're looking for a sibling or a parent, and if they think they found one, they reach out to them asking them for their DNA to see if it's a match. What was your reaction when you got the DNA results back? I knew, I knew it was him. I was totally convinced that that was my uncle that they found. It turns out Jack never got on a plane. He never even left the state. In 1984, two years after his disappearance, his body was found in an old farm building in rural Missouri, just one hour from his home. His body was so badly decomposed, detectives couldn't determine who he was. His identity likely would have remained a mystery were it not for cutting edge technology. Your family felt closure in one respect of knowing now that Jack didn't just up and abandon his family. Right, they felt better about that. But. But. There's more to this story. <laughs> right. The mystery of where Jack was was finally solved, but there was another mystery, a much more sinister one, Jack was murdered, shot in the back of the head. What would it have done to your grandmother to know that he was murdered? She would have been, she would have been very sad, but it would have given her some closure to the whole situation. The question now is, who killed him? And the answer could once again lie with Fig. The introduction of Fig um, has really rocked the industry and created uh, not a new tool to replace traditional forensic DNA analysis, but a new tool to enhance tradi traditional forensic DNA analysis. Dr. Claire Glynn is a professor of forensic science at the University of New Haven, who also consults with law enforcement agencies across the U.S. and helps them utilize FIG. She says it's having success beyond identifying remains. It's a tool that's still pretty much in its infancy, yet it's re uh, helped resolve over nearly 600 cases in just a five uh, year period. Cases like the murder of Sarah Yarbrough. When we got there, that was when they told us that her, her body had been found. The 16 year old was found raped and murdered in 1991. Genetic genealogy helped lead to the arrest and first degree murder conviction of her killer, Patrick Nicholas, in 2023. The hope is FIG will help solve many more cold and open cases. We don't really ever think of uh, FIG cases as being unsolvable. Including the case of who murdered Jack Langeneckert. They found me, so who knows, maybe, they, maybe they'd be able to find him. Researchers want to stress if you use Ancestry DNA or 23andMe, they cannot access these databases for FIG. You have to upload your DNA profile voluntarily to sites like GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA, which investigators can access, leading them to solve these mysteries. Still ahead, secondhand shopping becoming a first choice for many Americans. I do thrift a lot. Probably my favorite place is going to be, it's known, it's, we call it the bins, but it's known as the Goodwill Clearance Center where you pay by the pound. Um, you're, you're literally digging for treasure. What's behind the surge in thrifting and how you can cash in. Plus the cost of gun violence reaches far beyond the crime tape. And the reality is, is that some of our patients that survive have totally life altering injuries that change their lives forever. We reveal its emotional and financial toll on communities. You can watch Investigate TV Plus anytime streaming online. Get the app for Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. They're free to download. Nothing is more devastating than the loss of life when it comes to gun violence victims and survivors ultimately pay the biggest price. It's a complex issue that is also proving to be expensive. According to Every Town for Gun Safety Research, in 2019, the annual economic cost of gun violence in the U.S. was $557 billion. The same group says the average taxpayer was on the hook that year for almost $1,700. 
That's for police investigations, the judicial system, and medical treatments, which can sometimes last a lifetime. Reporter Blair Sable shows us how a South Carolina community is hoping to break the cycle of violence. I'm a gun violence survivor. Not a day goes by that advocate Keith Smalls doesn't think about his son. I didn't get a phone call and said he was in the hospital. I got a phone call and said he was dead. This is not what you want. His child, only 17 at the time, gunned down by a 15-year-old. A normal day for Smalls now involves checking in with his clients every morning, who he's hopeful to free from the risky environments he finds them in. What led to his son's death and the death of so many others comes with added costs, in addition to the high price already paid with their lives. Gun violence in America causes an estimated $557 billion in expenses a year, with taxpayers on the hook for $371.9 million, according to the nonprofit Everytown Research. From mass shootings that get a lot of attention... There was a bunch of kids and all of a sudden we heard a bunch of gunshots and everyone started running. To the ones we don't always hear about. More often than not, we hear something like this. Charleston County deputies say a 17-year-old is expected to be okay after he was shot in the hand Saturday night in Hollywood. But that's only part of the story. And the reality is, is that some of our patients that survive have totally life-altering injuries that change their lives forever. And that doesn't come without a high price tag either. Medical bills, follow-up care, lost wages, plus the cost of law enforcement investigations and the judicial system all add up. This is a problem that impacts everyone in some way, shape or form, even if they don't realize it. Dr. Ashley Hink is a trauma surgeon at the Medical University of South Carolina and sees the worst of the worst day after day in the operating room. The overwhelming majority of injuries that we see are assaults. It runs the gamut from community violence, drive-by shootings, interpersonal altercations, intimate partner violence, youth on youth violence. For years, she's found herself treating the symptoms, but not the cause of her patients' injuries. So she founded Turning the Tide, a violence intervention program at the hospital to do just that. And she was like in a guardian angel, name was Keith Smalls, and I did this, I started crying. Smalls, now a client advocate for the program, channels his grief into his work. He's often right there at the bedside of some of the youngest victims right after they've been shot. You know, 11, 12, 13, so many of our patients, victims, don't want the situation that they have. Turning the Tide advocates aim to fill in the gaps where gun violence victims need support the most, addressing modifiable risk factors that can make people susceptible to the violence. The doctors are doing life-saving emergent medical care and we do soul care, we do heart work. Advocates like Smalls and Catherine Yetman may help bring groceries, drive kids to school, provide access to resources and set up job interviews. It doesn't matter what, what you go through. A client who agreed to speak to us while concealing his identity said that being connected to an advocate after he was shot felt like destiny. Can they beat you down? And with this program, it's basically like, it, help, it helps anybody. That, that need that chance. The program reports success stories after only its second year, some of them continuing to stay with the advocates who work with the victims every day. I've got a letter that I keep above my desk. He writes, I'll never forget about you. Your kindness gives me hope and confidence. Had I not been there, had this program not existed, he would not have gotten what he got, which is what he deserved. But this costly problem can't be solved alone. To find a solution to an issue as persistent and complex as gun violence, these advocates say, like emergent surgery, it's all hands on deck. According to Everytown Research, South Carolina has the 10th highest cost of gun violence, with each taxpayer responsible for $2,700 per year. You can calculate the cost of gun violence in your community. Just head to everytownresearch.org and search economic cost calculator. Still ahead, the joy of collecting. This is uh, full of signs and vehicles down here. Comes from the thrill of a great find. This man's journey collecting antique items and the stories behind them. 
plus clearing your closet and turning it into cash. We reveal why secondhand shopping is seeing a surge in popularity and how you can get the most out of selling your old clothes. Our in-depth coverage continues. You can get connected to Investigate TV Plus on all social media platforms. For more Americans, secondhand shopping is becoming a first choice. According to the online thrift store ThreadUp, the secondhand market is expected to reach $90 billion in the next 10 years. Reporter Susan Campbell explains what's fueling the growth and how you can get the most for the items you clear from your closet. Rachel Smith started reselling clothes a few years ago. It just gave me something to do from home with a little one where I could make some extra money and contribute to the household on my own time. Now she has 206,000 followers on Poshmark. I do thrift a lot. Probably my favorite place is going to be, it's known, it's, we call it the bins, but it's known as the Goodwill Clearance Center where you pay by the pound. Um, you're, you're literally digging for treasure. It's treasure that turns into cash. Secondhand shopping overall is just booming right now. Um, and we're seeing different pockets of the country really thriving, and the Phoenix area is certainly one of those. According to Poshmark, there are more than 64,000 sellers on the site just in Phoenix. The company's Mallory Smith says inflation is helping to drive the spike in reselling. People are really looking for ways to make money, to get rid of some items, to help supplement things. We also are seeing a rise in sustainability being a really big driver for the decisions people are making. A lot of Gen Z specifically um, are really conscious about the landfills and where these sort of fast fashion items are going. There are a lot of different ways to make sales. On Poshmark and Mercari, sellers take their own photos, set their own prices, and ship items that sell. Right up and the real real are more like a consignment shop. You send in your stuff and get a cut of any sales. Cleaning out your closet is a perfect way to start. For Rachel, it's way more than cleaning out the closet. It's all turned into a full-time job, even hosting live shows on the site. It's trial and error, and I would say that what might work for me might not work for another seller. So if you have a niche, let's say someone who is, they may already have a passion for like, just say handbags, or, or shoes. Start with what you know and build, build on that. I absolutely love secondhand shopping. I found some really nice stuff that way. I gotta tell you, with inflation, what it is, mm -hmm. and prices going up, it's a great way to find some good bargains for many people, too. And that was a cute purse from that story. <laughs> I might have to go back and she get She was that. talking about the purses as yeah. we were watching, too. Nice bag. All right. To get the most for your money, NerdWallet says you should wash or dry clean clothes before you try to sell them, polish hardware on shoes and bags, and buff out scuff marks. If you're posting your own items, it's important to take quality photos and write an honest description. Still ahead, meet an expert. Basically did everything by myself. At turning something old into something new. Never had a, had a inkling that uh, that's how it would turn out. How his humble collection started. A big red barn in central Wisconsin wouldn't normally turn heads, but this one certainly does. It's covered with dozens of vintage signs, and there are even more treasures inside. Reporter Dale Ryman introduces us to the man behind the massive collection. When driving along Highway 52 in and out of Wausau, you'll pass by this barn. Well, I bought it in the early 1990s. One corner at a time. Reinforced soldier with steel beams. Dick Week has rebuilt the old barn. Basically did everything by myself, and it was completely overcome by brush, and uh, you could hardly see the barn. A self-described old guy with a bad habit of collecting. Tractor collection, old car collection, bamboo fly rod, wood canoe, you name it, just about anything. Including the antique signs that decorate it today. I tried to get all porcelain, but uh, they get really, really expensive. Approximately 115 signs hang on three sides, each one has a story, starting with number one. On that end there is a Texaco sign, and it was one of the first signs I bought. It's about six feet tall, it's porcelain. And I got it on an Iola, and we had two guys go up the ladder, and then we had two guys inside with a rope that got it up there. On the inside, the barn is used for storing items from Dick's hobbies. 
top and bottom. This is uh, full of signs and vehicles down here. I have signs all over there. Behind this, I have uh, three VW. It's definitely his baby, yeah. <laughs> When Linda married Dick last year, she knew what came with their union. I think it's great. You know, you need to have something to, you know, fill your time that you enjoy. The tour through the past continues beyond the barn, a graveyard, if you will, for old gas station signs. Never had a had a inkling that uh, that's how it would turn out. Then there's the rusted out fire truck and owed to his 24 years as a volunteer fireman with the town of Wausau. Now at 73, the retired teacher is done adding signs to his property and says he'll enjoy it for what it is. Texaco sign that I paid $50 for, they're asking three or 4,000. And every month there are auctions uh, nationwide where they just sell, I mean, people have huge collections, thousands and thousands of dollars they pay for signs and I'm not in that league. So keep in mind, what's old to you would be new to someone else. Before you think about throwing something in the garbage, somebody might enjoy it. I need to have my wife, Jenny, watch that story. because uh -huh. so, so I like to keep everything and she likes to throw everything away. So that would just shock her. I think you guys balance each other out. Maybe then. that's it, yeah. Like that couple. They're, like, yeah. They do balance each other too. Very nice. Well, that's going to do it for us on Investigate TV Plus. Thanks for watching. I'm T Chappelle. And I'm Lee Zurich. On the next Investigate TV Plus, catalytic converter thefts surge across the country. We expose the crime rings fueling the thefts. Plus, we go in-depth to find out what's being done to protect your car.